Hey there, and welcome once again to Four People Who Love Music. That's you, and that's me, and that's all of us, I hope. I'm Richard Maddow, and I'm your host. And today we're going to talk about the best live albums of all time. Well, we love live albums, don't they? Just a totally different vibe than studio albums. I think they both make up, um, you know, part of our, our listening experience, of course, but there's just something different about a live album, especially those that can transport you right to the concert or do even more. And I think the 10 that we're going to talk about today do even much, much more than that. You'll see what I'm talking about in a second. Now, um, these are my favorite live albums. I'm not saying they're the 10 best of all time, whatever that means, but these are my favorites and they might not be yours. So if you agree or you disagree, you want to list some of your own, please use the comment section below. I'd love to hear what some of your favorite live albums are and why. And please take a second to subscribe so you can always find out when new videos come out. Now, you know, the typical rock concert, they kind of have a formula. The band, they play the hits. Uh, they play them a little bit faster than on the studio recordings. Throw in a few deep cuts for the big fans. Um, do long intros, especially on that one song that everybody's waiting for. They do like this mysterious five minute long intro. So nobody's sure. And then they finally start the song. It's like, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? Boom. Oh, that's it. And everybody goes crazy. Um, you know, and when in doubt, use a lot of stage smoke. And I think that's kind of the formula for live concert. And it has been since the 60s. Um, and, you know, many live albums kind of follow that formula as well, because they are documents of these live concerts. And those are great but I don't think they're great enough to be in my top 10 list. Maybe they're on yours. Uh, an example I can think of offhand is, uh, is Wings Over America. I mean, that was an incredible tour. Paul McCartney, obviously, um, arguably the most gifted and important musician of our time. Certainly McCartney and Dylan are, are up in that category. Um, but as great as this concert was, he pretty much played the hits, you know, both Wings and Beatles, a few unexpected songs, but this, album Wings Over America was a document of that concert that was quite formulaic and even though I love that album I played it over and over and over and over again doesn't warrant uh, in my top 10 anyway maybe it's in yours so let's get started and we'll find out why these 10 live albums are so special okay let's start with an album from 1971 and that is Four Way Street by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young now at this point um, not counting their solo work, they had two studio albums. The first one, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Then Neil Young joined for the second one, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and Young, Deja Vu. And both total classics. But they were also both a very polished, incredible harmonies, great musicianship, you know, all that stuff. And they, they were fantastic listening experiences. But this live album was just all about the songs. Disc one was acoustic and pretty much solo performances. Graham Nash did a new song called Right Between the Eyes that was incredible. Um, Neil Young did Cowgirl in the Sand and Don't Let Her Bring You Down. Totally different than the album versions. Just Neil on guitar with that voice and that delivery. Oh, just amazing. Um, the, the banter between the songs is absolutely hilarious. Then for disc two, they went completely electric. Songs like Long Time Gone, Southern Man, Carry On, really took on new life with this full band just cranking it out. Um, amazing live albums. That's my number 10, Four Way Street by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Okay, album number nine is by Frank Zappa and the Mothers. It's from 1974, and it's called Roxy and Elsewhere. Now, some of it may not be appealing to everyone. I mean, there's no question Zappa's an acquired taste. I can't say that I'm a huge Zappa fan, and I can't say that I even love this whole album. So if I don't love the whole album, how can it be on the top 10? Well, I would say that sides two and three, and if you're uh, if you're playing along and you're just on Spotify, you have the CD, of course, it's different. Um, I believe that is Village of the Sun through More Trouble Every Day, I'm pretty sure. Um, these two sides are some of the greatest live performances ever recorded with one of the most amazing bands ever, George Duke on keyboards, Bruce Fowler on trombone, Walt Fowler on trumpet, and Napoleon Murphy Brock on vocals, and of course the amazing Ruth Underwood on marimbas and xylophones and all kinds of percussion. She was just 
incredible. This whole album is wow, especially that side two and three, Village of the Sun, through More Trouble Every Day. I honestly think um, possibly some of the best live music ever recorded. Just a band that is so tight and so loose at the same time. You got to hear it to believe it. Okay, number eight is from a band that is certainly known more for their live performances than their recordings, and that's the Grateful Dead. And, um, you know, they say there's nothing like a Grateful Dead concert. And I think if you weren't fortunate enough to have seen the Dead live from their start in the 60s, I mean, sadly, they started going downhill with Jerry's declining health. But I'm going to say if you saw them anywhere from their start in the 60s through 78 and maybe some years in the 80s. And then I think they kind of perked up towards the end of the 80s there a little bit, but just nothing like a Dead concert. And they have so many great live albums. But the definitive live Grateful Dead album to me is Europe 72. Now, some people, if you really want to get picky, might say, well, it's not officially a live album because when they got back from Europe, they went back into the studio and, and redid some of the vocals. But I think it's pretty safe to say that most live albums have some redubs and some polishing here and there. So we're not going to worry about that because it's a live album. It sounds like a live album. It plays like a live album. Europe 72. Um, they did a great combination of some already well-known songs, songs like Sugar Magnolia, Truckin', Cumberland Blues, but they also introduced many songs that had previously not been recorded that became total staples of the Grateful Dead repertoire until their demise um, in 1995. Songs like Tennessee Jed, Brown Eyed Women, Jack Straw, He's Gone. Um, it had the definitive version, in my opinion, of the great China Cat Sunflower into I Know You Rider medley became known amongst deadheads as China Rider. Just an amazing album. Great intro to the dead, even if you're not that familiar with them. One, one that shouldn't be missed. Okay, number seven on my top 10 favorite live albums is Live Bullet, the 1976 album by Bob Seeger. Now, some live albums will transport you right to the concert. I mean, not just right to the concert, but you feel like you're standing there. You can, you, your ears are ringing and you can smell it and you, you feel like you're being bumped into by people next to you. That's how great this album is. You are really, really, really transported to that day in Detroit in 1976. Now, speaking of Detroit, Bob Seger at this time was a superstar in Detroit, but unknown everywhere else. They say that he played packed hockey arenas in Detroit and then the next day would, would take his band to Chicago where they sold less than a thousand tickets and it really is true he was a legend in his own hometown until he exploded with this album we'll put him in the big leagues a rambling gambling man heavy music in the cat man do just incredible and the definitive live version of turn the page the one that you know the one that I know the one that everyone knows with that just chilling sax introduction by Alto Reed, who unfortunately passed away recently. So that is Live Bullet by Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band. Okay, let's continue. 1976, we've got Little Feet and Waiting for Columbus. This album contains pretty much every great Little Feet song up until then. Now, Little Feet is a band from California, although I think they really achieved more popularity where I'm from here on the East Coast. Uh, in, in my college days, everybody knew Little Feet. Their shows were jam-packed. As a matter of fact, much of Waiting for Columbus was recorded at Lisner Auditorium in Washington, D.C. But they didn't really have that large national following. Now, this is a band of incredibly talented musicians, great songwriting, and this album made the songs just come alive even funkier, even better instrumentation. They had the Tower of Power horn section and that great one-two guitar punch of the late Lowell George and, and Paul Barrere, Bill Kane on keyboards, and Bill Payne, I'm sorry, Billy Payne on keyboards, one of the all-time greats on the keys. Every song rocks. Every song's got that funky, swampy, little feet sound. So definitely check out Waiting for Columbus. Great cover too. So just a good album from start to finish. Okay, number five, top 10 live albums is Nirvana. MTV Unplugged in New York from 1996. Now, MTV Unplugged was a great idea. You take bands that were usually known for being electric, you bring them into the MTV studios or sometimes other small venues. You have a small studio audience and the band just plays acoustic music. And usually, you know, renditions of their hits 
done acoustically. And it was fun and I loved watching it, but I can't say these concerts were standouts. And even the ones that, that came out on uh, official releases, kind of boring, I don't know. MTV, uh, Nirvana changed the MTV formula with Unplugged. You know, they were a little boring, a little predictable, but this album contained none of their hits with the exception of maybe Come As You Are, which wasn't really a hit yet. It had lots of covers, a bunch of songs by the Meat Puppets, um, a great cover of David Bowie's Man Who Sold the World, Lead Belly's Where Did You Sleep? They did just no encore. There was just something so magical about this album. And I know a lot of people think, well, you know, I know Nirvana is great, but they're just a little too heavy for me. I can't get into that. We'll start with this album. It will show you that, you know, on the Nirvana songs here, it's all about the songwriting on the covers, just the performance, the beauty of Kurt Cobain's voice and ability to interpret these songs. Ah, it's an incredible listen. You will never get sick of it. Okay, albums number four and three have something in common. And when I tell you what it is, you'll probably be able to figure out what they are. Uh, these were the absolute artistic and commercial breakthroughs for these artists. They contain the definitive versions of their classics. I guess you could say these aren't just live albums, but these are the defining albums for these artists, the artists that catapulted them into superstardom and remain their best known and best albums. So you've probably figured out already. Number four is from 1976, Frampton Comes Alive. Yeah, Peter Frampton kind of knocked around in humble pie for a bit. Uh, I believe he had four studio albums and just wasn't making his mark, um, especially in the US, but even in Europe, um, just, just wasn't putting it together. I don't know. And then out comes Frampton Comes Alive and boom, he is a superstar. He's everywhere. You can't go anywhere without hearing Peter Frampton. You know the songs in this album. Show me the way, baby, I love your way. All I want to be is by your side. Do you feel like we do? It's an album that I, I think, you know, certainly in my day, everybody played over and over and over and over and over again. You couldn't get away with it. You couldn't get away from it. <laughs> it was so overplayed. It almost became a cliche, but it's still great all these years later. Frampton comes alive from 1976. Okay, you've probably figured out the next one because also a career defining album for a band that is just one of the greatest bands ever. And of course, we're talking about At Fillmore East by the Allman Brothers from 1971. This had the classic Allman lineup, Dwayne Allman, who passed not long after this album. Um, Greg Allman, Dickie Betts, Barry Oakley on bass. And it's just got the songs that you know and love, Statesboro Blues, In Memory of Elizabeth Reed, Whipping Post, um, the guitar duetting was just unfathomably incredible. So I know you know this album. I don't have to tell you even much more about it, but at Fillmore East by the Allman Brothers. Okay, album number two. You know, there's just something special about seeing a great, great band when they're on the verge when they're just about to break out, when they're hungry, when they've got everything to lose and everything to gain. And that is what the second album on this list is all about. It's Bruce Springsteen and E Street Band, Hammersmith Odeon, London, 1975. Now, Bruce had two great studio albums, Reading from Asbury Park, New Jersey, and The Wild, The Innocent, and E Street Shuffle. Um, just was, you know, barely popular in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland area. Fortunately for me, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. So when we used to go, you know, in high school to Ocean City, Maryland, our beach town, there'd be some beach bums and the music made its way from Asbury Park down to Ocean City, Maryland. So I was lucky enough to be to have been turned on to Bruce Springsteen um, before Born to Run came out. But as you know, his first two albums were commercial flops. Um, People that had seen his live show knew that he and his band were incredibly special, but he just wasn't breaking through. And everything was on the line with this album. Everything was on the line with this tour. Um, it was the first major tour with two just superb additions to the E Street Band, Mighty Max Weinberg on drums and the professor Roy Bitten on piano. And I think Max and Roy really are responsible for the sound of the E Street Band. It's certainly, you know, post the first two albums where they weren't in the band. And then the sound just changed. It got more refined. It got, hard to say, just got more Bruce, more E Street Band 
um, and they were on this tour. This was their first big tour with them. You know, of course, it has some of the greats, Thunder Road, Backstreet, Kitty's Back, Rosalita, Jungle Land, his world famous Detroit medley, but they were just playing with this hunger, like everything was on the line. They had to come through or else it was all over with. And they did it. I was lucky enough to see them on this 1975 tour. And I've got to see, tell you, um, I've seen over a thousand concerts and seeing Bruce and the East Street Band in 1975 was absolutely one of the greatest concert experiences of my life. Now, unless you're uh, talking to Doc Brown and you've got a DeLorean, you can't go back to 1975 to experience this concert, but hearing this disc and, and watching the video also, it comes close. Um, so check it out. Even if you're not a Bruce fan, you will totally dig the energy. Okay, before we get to number one, I just want to mention Bob Dylan because he is not number one. Bob Dylan is one of my favorite artists of all time. And some people that have seen Dylan in concert, especially in the recent years, just say he's horrible. He can't sing. He doesn't care. He doesn't acknowledge the audience. He mumbles through the songs. You don't even know what song he's playing until halfway through. If you're lucky, sometimes you don't even know what song he played until you saw the set list the next day. And I got to say, yes, sadly, all of those things are true. I hate to say it. But when Bob Dylan was on, when he was on stage and he was on, and we're talking about, of course, you know, the earlier part of his career, he was spectacular. He was in control of his band, of his voice, of every beat, every single way that he wavered the pitch to just dance around the pitch and go higher and lower. And the way he held out notes and emoted like no one else Absolutely. I'm going to say it. I know most people won't believe it, but Dylan is one of the greatest live performers of all time. Um, if you've seen him on a bad night, you probably don't agree. So you're going to have to take my word for it. But um, Dylan never really put together a live album that I think straight up and down, back to start to finish, back and forth, was good enough to make my top 10 list. But um, there are definitely some sparks on his albums that were incredible. Um, before the flood, an album he did with the band. So he only really gets two sides of Dylan performances. The, the band does many. They're great songs. It's a fantastic album. It just didn't make my top 10. But the version of It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only Bleeding and Don't Think Twice It's All Right on this album are absolutely incredible. Search them out. Um, the concert for Bangladesh was a multi- artist superstar concert thrown by George Harrison, I think it was 1971. Um, Leon Russell's on there, Badfinger, Ringo, Ravi Shankar, of course, George Harrison. Uh, but Dylan gets one side of this album, and I think it's probably the finest one side of live Dylan ever recorded. I don't think it's on streaming services yet, but if you can find the concert for Bangladesh, even for that one side of six, of Bob Dylan, It's Worth Your While. The Rolling Thunder Review album that came out recently, the soundtrack to the Martin Scorsese movie, totally awesome, especially the song Isis. And one of my favorite live Dylan albums is At Budokan. It's a maligned album. It got horrible reviews. I don't care. I love it. So check out some live Dylan. You, you can't go wrong with these. Okay, now the number one, or at least my number one favorite live album. I'll start with a little story only because I really feel it's necessary to frame this album historically for me. And I think it'll put it in some context too for you. So it was uh, August 27th, 1977. I was in college. I went to see Jackson Brown, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite artists and Meriwether Post Pavilion, which is, that's our local outdoor shed, you know, cool outdoor venue. Everybody played there. It's between Baltimore and Washington. So kind of share those two markets. And um, spent many, many, many a summer night there, either in the pavilion or on the lawn, enjoying great music, doing all kinds of crazy fun things. So I'm there August 27, 1977 to see Jackson Brown. And as it can be with live shows, there's this annoying woman right behind me. And she wanted to hear the song Road and the Sky, a great Jackson Brown song you may know. And the whole night in my ear, I'm hearing Road in the Sky road in the sky. Oh my God, I wanted to just turn around and tell her to shut up. But you know, it's a live concert. Anything goes, I guess. So I didn't, I didn't say anything to her. And the concert was great. He played some 
new songs that we'd never heard before, some great old songs, had his classic Jackson Brown band with him, of course, Russ Conkle and Lee Scalar and all these Craig Durge, just fantastic musicians. So I kind of forgot about it. A few months passes, the new Jackson Brown album comes out. It's called Running on Empty. I didn't know anything about it. I got it, went back to my dorm room, put it on my turntable, and it starts with some crowd noise. And the first thing I hear is, road in the sky. It's like, ah, is this a flashback? I couldn't believe it. I realized he was recording live music that night for the Running on Empty album. But that's not why this is number one of my favorite live albums of all time. Well, maybe it helps. But this was a concept album about being on the road. And the songs weren't just recorded live at, at concerts. They were recorded live in hotel rooms, uh, backstage in the rehearsal rooms, even on the Silver Eagle tour bus. He recorded the song Nothing But Time, and you can hear the engine kind of shifting gears and revving up. So what a genius concept we're going to do. You know, songs about the road to become a little cliched, let's face it, but Jackson Brown's idea was amazing. We're going to do it album all new songs by the way unlike most live albums these are all songs that we hadn't heard before except if you got to see them live that summer which luckily i did all songs about touring um the road cocaine shaky town rosie which was recorded backstage one of the funniest songs about being on the road ever and of course the title truck track title truck i'm <laughs> thinking about transportation the title track running on empty is a classic and most of all um, I was lucky to be there the night he recorded this. He said he played it for the first time ever, The Loadout, which is the song he dedicates to his crew, which segues into a hilarious version of the old Maurice Williams and the Zodiac song, Stay. This is something that's, I think, never been attempted before or since. And he pulled it off incredibly well because despite the fact that all these songs were new and that they all wrapped around this concept, Every song is incredibly strong. It's a listening experience of a live album like no other. So that's my number one live album of all time, Running on Empty by Jackson Brown. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Please place your albums, or if you want to say yay or nay to my albums, that's fine. Put them in the comments. Um, this is for people who love music. I'm Richard Maddow. I hope you subscribe and tell your friends. Thanks so much for being with me. I'll see you soon.